Hello, and welcome to this episode of Military History Inside Out. Today I speak with George Theotokos about his new book on the Byzantium uh, military in the 10th century. He also discusses the Arab uh, military at this time as well, because these, these were the two main adversaries that uh, are the focus of his book. So thank you and enjoy. I'm speaking with George Theotokos, author of Byzantine Military Tactics in Syria and Mesopotamia in the 10th Century. Thank you for speaking with me. It's a pleasure. So first, tell me, how did you get into uh, studying and writing about this subject? It came up uh, as an idea while I was uh, discussing uh, postdoctoral uh, uh, postdoctoral ideas and projects with my uh, PhD supervisor, who is an expert in military history, Professor Matthew Strickland from the uh, University of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was doing my PhD and while I was in the final stages of my PhD studies, um, I came across uh, some uh, uh, ideas in the primary sources that I was studying that looked very interesting to um, take on in the future. And uh, that's why I thought that it would be something very interesting. And I discussed it with several experts in the field, including my, uh, being my, my supervisor, my uh, thesis supervisor and others. And they said that this is something that hasn't been done so far. And I thought that uh, I'll take it on and I will try to uh, write a good study about it. So <laughs> it's that simple. It came, it came out as, uh, it, it was a byproduct, as we, as we say, you know, just gathering little bits and pieces from my PhD thesis. And then I thought that that looks interesting and I will uh, try to uh, write a book about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Just to, um, I'm going to ask you about the book now, um, just to make sure I'm on the right page as far as the setting for what's going on in Byzantine Empire in the 10th century. Uh, from okay. what, from what I saw, this is sort of a resurgence of the empire after a period of decline, possibly. This is, I guess this is the period of the, the Macedonian dynasty. And, uh, uh yes, exactly. And um, and it appears that their main enemies at this point are sort of the Bulgars to the west, Arab states more or less to the east, and perhaps the Kiev Rus to the north. Um, the the main, uh, if if we may say, the main enemy uh, for this period, actually the period of the so-called, and I put it in inverted commas, the uh, <laughs> the great expansion, uh, as it has. Called uh, uh, of the Byzantine Empire, the, the great expansion in the east. The primary enemy, of course, are the Arab dynasty of the Hadhramids of Aleppo, based in Aleppo, but of course they dominated the entire southeast, uh, uh, southeast Anatolia and northern Syria. So they are the main enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, Byzantium, at that point, after a period of about 200 years of again what many historians call the Dark Ages. Uh, they uh, also have other enemies in the west, they have the uh, Russians in the north, uh, but the main enemy uh, for this period, let's say in the 10th century, so from the 920s and until more or less the 960s, the 970s, are the Arabs in the east. So they are the main enemy, they are the main focus of the emperors when it comes to their military expansion, for many reasons, of course. Okay, so... Uh... Now that we have that settled, um, tell me about the book. Uh, <laughs> it's a great book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it is uh, a, what I do in the book is I compare military cultures, and uh, military cultures is something that uh, first and foremost I had to make clear, I had to clarify in the introduction of the book because you know not too many people are familiar what, what exactly is a military culture. So um, to make it simple, is just how a specific nation or a culture perceives war in general. So that's the very the simplest definition that I can give. Mm -hmm. So how they understand war and how they behave uh, in war, in battle as well, but in general in war, their customs, their organization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what, I, what I do in the book is I compare military cultures. I compare the military culture of the Byzantines, so how they fought 
and how they understood war, uh, because of course there is an element of religion as well, as, as we all know, mm-hmm. and I compare their military culture with the uh, military culture of the Arabs of Aleppo, the Habanid dynasty of the uh, of Aleppo. So, what I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, analyze, I wanted to examine how exactly they fought, and the most important thing, how they reacted to the. Uh, strategies, the battle tactics, the logistics, and the customs of their enemies. And the key question in my book is whether they adapted to their enemies or not. That's the key question. And this is what I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to give an answer in my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, of course, I put a little bit more emphasis in the Byzantine side of the, of the story because we have more evidence. Unfor- unfortunately, but uh, I wanted to see how they fight and whether they adapt to their enemies. Mm-hmm. So, looking at the uh, different chapters of the book, um, I guess it, uh, so. I'm, I'm looking at uh, you're looking at the uh, you discuss the grand strategy and obviously a lot of the tactics that that plays into what you're talking about. Exactly. So I wanted to. Can you go into a little more detail or you know about what you found? Exactly, I will. Um, I, st- I start with the grand strategy because I wanted to give the necessary background to the uh, to the audience, to the readers, as to why uh, Eastern Anatolia is much more important for the Byzantine Empire than the uh, Balkans or the uh, or Italy at the time. Because, as you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, uh, in the in the ten- during the tenth century, the Byzantines had many enemies. They always had. They had enemies in the Balkans. They had enemies uh, in Italy. They had enemies in Crete. Uh, we have an, uh, an Arab dynasty there as well, and uh, they had enemies coming from the uh, from the Black Sea, the northern coast of the Black Sea. But of course, they had uh, a very sensitive uh, and very fluid borders in the east, both in the northeast of Anatolia, in the Armenian. Uh, the region of Lower Armenia, but also in the southeast with the Arabs. What I try to do and what I try to um, clarify in my introduction is I'm trying to uh, answer as to why the war with the Habanids, the war that I'm examining in my book, why it escalated into this life and death conflict between the Byzantine emperors and the Habanid dynasty why Southeast Anatolia is important, why is it more important than Armenia, and this is also a key question that had been answered by Jonathan Shepard, a very famous Byzantinist, but I'm, I'm trying to expand on this, uh, on this question, and why uh, something that seemed like uh, a very localized conflict developed into, again, as I said before, a life and death war uh, that lasted for about two decades. Uh, this is what I do in my introduction. And then, um, what I do in the, uh, in the main chapters of my uh, study is that I'm trying to see how the ways that uh, military knowledge is transmitted uh, over the borders, so from the Byzantines to the Arabs and vice versa, so I'm examining their strategy, I'm examining their battle tactics, I'm examining their equipment, the military equipment, and uh, for that purpose I have two pools of evidence. Um, let me remind the audience that the 10th century is a period of uh, great proliferation of the military manuals in Byzantium. Hmm. We have six which is an extraordinary number of surviving military manuals, all in the, uh, dated between 900 and 990. So these military manuals, they put down the knowledge of the, uh, of the Byzantines in, on paper. And that's fine because we know how they were supposed to fight. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. And then, I 
I, I go through the I go through the sources. I go through the military manuals, and I can I detect and I spot the changes in their military tactics that are that can be attributed to the fact that they were adapting to their enemies. But that's the theory. What I do in the second half of the book is I examine the primary sources. I examine the histories and the chronicles of the period both the Byzantine histories and the Arabic histories and the Armenian histories, and then what I'm trying to do is whether this theory is translated into practice, whether if we um, actually study the battles through the uh, Greek, Arabic, and Armenian sources, whether we can actually see that there were changes, whether these generals that they were studying these military manuals applied these advices that they were reading in the manuals, whether they were applied them in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So this is what I do. And I also have a very interesting chapter on uh, espionage, mm -hmm. because espionage is, of course, uh, the primary method of exchanging <laughs> military knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have uh, about 10, 15 pages of my conclusions at the end that are also quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the thing is that we cannot be sure, unfortunately. We cannot be sure because the sources for this period are not accurate enough when it comes to the description of the battles. Mm -hmm. And um, the theory... So the military manuals provide enough evidence for us to uh, understand that there was a change, but there were many changes in terms of battle tactics, and the Byzantines were changing their tactics, probably because of their experiences in the battlefield, uh, especially because we have evidence that the generals who were uh, suggesting these changes, they had significant experience in fighting in the East, so they were the ones who were introducing these changes in the Byzantine army, in the structure of the Byzantine army, and the tactics of the Byzantine army. But when it comes to uh, translating this theory into practice, the primary sources are not as detailed as we would have wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, very unfortunate thing is that the uh, both the uh, the Greek sources, the sources written in Greek, to be more precise, and the sources written in Arabic and the sources written in Armenian, um, they do not, because they are medieval chronicles, of course, they do not place much attention into the description of the actual battle and into the maneuvers of the armies, mm -hmm. because they didn't care most of the time. They just didn't care. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't have the details, the necessary details to uh, cross-check whether the changes that they were applying in the military manuals, whether they were, of course, uh, applied also in the battlefield. So I have two questions. Um, the first sort of uh, touches on espionage and perhaps governance, which is, do you mm -hmm. have information? First of all, you might not have this information, but along the border, did... Did both sides have to maintain garrisons to just keep their populations in check? Uh, how, how fortified was it? You know, how did they maintain control at the front? Were they basically, you know, was yes. it was the population connected to them culturally and religious by religion, or how did that work out? And yes, uh, well, first of all, we have to understand that you know. Uh, during this period, in the, in the 10th century, we have a very fluid borders. Uh, we don't have the borders we understand it today, of course, and it was very difficult to uh, impose any sort of, you know, firm control on the borders and, you know, to check on who was getting in and out of the country. There was, there were checks, of course, but um, it was the population of the borders uh, on both sides, both on the uh, side of the Arabs, but also the uh, very famous uh, Akritis, so which, of course, in Greek uh, translates into the uh, people of the borders. Um, 
the evidence that we have about these populations, uh, they were very diverse, both linguistically, socially, culturally, and, uh, of course, when it comes to uh, religion. And in uh, the popular imagination of the, uh, of the Byzantines, these, uh, there are many epic poems of these Akritas, uh, where they have their own traditions, they have their own customs, they have their own laws, and they do not care about the orders uh, coming from Constantinople. Hmm. That says a lot because they impose their own regime. And in this uh, folklore uh, story about uh, the Yenis Akritas, the Yenis means from two uh, generations, so he's half and half. Mm-hmm. He's half Greek, half Arab. Uh, of course, he's Christian, but his uh, his mom was uh, no, uh, so his dad was Arab, coming from the other side. Um, in this very famous epic story of the Yenisakritas, um his accomplishments were so famous that even the emperor comes to visit him. Mm-hmm. Uh, allegedly, of course. And uh, he comes to visit him, so the, the, the Byzantine emperor, the, uh, the Roman emperor, from Istanbul to visit him in the borders. And uh, he tells him that, uh, thank you for all your admiration, Basel, the Yenisakritas, that tells him that thank you for all your admiration, but this but we do things differently here. We have our own customs here. Mm-hmm. Uh, tells a lot about the regime in the borders and um, the transmission of knowledge over the borders. Again, it was vice versa, you know, from the Byzantines to the Arabs and vice versa. It was uh, a very fluid issue. It could change uh, month after month. Mm. So uh, uh, both people and goods and ideas could very easily be transported over the borders. Again, not just, you know, from Byzantium to the Arabs, but also vice versa. So uh, this is one side. But, of course, there were official spies as well. And, uh, unfortunately, we don't know much about them. But uh, there were official spies sent uh, from uh, from the state, from the Byzantine state, and of course the Arabs, the Arab dynasties, uh, ecclesiastics, monks uh, were uh, going on a pilgrimage, were of course uh, a very good way to procure information or uh, sensitive information about the enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh, merchants, always, they always have been. Mm-hmm. And we are aware that in all these cases, of course there are others, but in all of these cases we are aware that both states, both the Byzantines and the Arabs, were aware that information, uh, sensitive information, uh, were leaking to the enemy. And they were orders, and they were complaints, and they were, uh, we have imprisonment of uh, officers for not doing their job properly, of uh, detaining possible spies, uh, that goes back to antiquity until now. So um, uh, what, I, what, what I'm doing in this uh, chapter of my book, uh, I, uh, I'm trying to examine all these channels mm-hmm. of transformation from one side to the other and see how these channels worked, how effective, of course, were the official state both the central state but the local authorities, because as I mentioned, um, uh, it's when we say state, you know, there is the uh, the central state, but of course we have the local authorities that are um, very ambiguous when it comes to their affiliation. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to see how, in which way, and how easy it was for information to pass over the border, over this fluid border that uh, that we have in the Middle Ages. So, a couple more quick questions just to wrap up this this issue about the border. Um, one, so really, who who would 
control a town? Is it is it more up to the locals? Uh, you know, basically, is it whoever has troops in that town or village or who collects taxes or, you know, how is that established? Uh, it depends on the period. <laughs> it depends on the period. And uh, in the period that I examine, uh, so the 10th century, um, uh, because it's a period of expansion for the Byzantine Empire, uh, the empire tries to reestablish its authority in the borders, uh, meaning that the uh, in the sensitive frontier areas, uh, the emperors are installing their own generals. They are installing their own officers, and they are installing their own people. Mm. Of course, when we are referring to the border areas, we are referring to the main, uh, to the capital cities, the capital towns of the border areas. Mm. So they are placing their own generals there. Usually, not always, but usually, these generals would have been locals in the 10th century. Hmm. So the 10th century is a very famous period for, uh, although some of these uh, theories are uh, being uh, challenged uh, now uh, by uh, Caldelis, uh, but the established theory is that the 10th century, the middle of the 10th century, is a period where the local aristocracy of Anatolia, central Anatolia and eastern Anatolia, is detaching itself from the central authority of Constantinople, and they are trying to uh, control these areas, of course, under the auspices of the, uh, of the empire, but it's like we are, the in, in the sources, we read the Nati, the powerful. So we are the powerful here. All of the offices will be, uh, will be held by our people, people from our clan, the extended family, and uh, all the local troops will be under our control. Now, further along the border, so in these regions that we call the Acra, the, in Greek, so the Limes, the, uh, the extremities, uh, again, this is a different story because in these extremities, we have the local chieftains, minor warlords, minor chieftains, who uh, have their um, their interested about their pocket and about their personal advancement, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest. Uh, so, this is, so this is this is what's happening on the Byzantine side. And there is a very similar situation on the Arab side as well. So, uh, and just to wrap this up, uh, there is... Um, one century after my period, so uh, written in uh, 1075, we have uh, a local general called Kekavmenos who is writing his Strategikon. Uh, and what is extraordinary about this military manual is that uh, the guy, so this general, is a local from these extremities, and he's writing a military manual, which is more like advices, mm-hmm. not a military manual, say, but advices uh, for his son on how to be a good local general in these extremities of the empire. And what he's saying in the uh, introduction of his strategicon, don't care about the uh, about what the uh, authorities, the central authorities in Constantinople tell you. Just check what your local interests are hmm. and make sure that you talk to the local emir on the other side, meaning the other side of the border, Mm. and see if you can make an arrangement with this guy. This is what he's saying. It's like, just don't care about what this emperor is telling you. Just look, you know, what you can do here in your locality. So that's one century later, but this is also the reality in the 10th century. Mm -hmm. How wide, how far apart were the forces, meaning, I know it's terrain dependent, but how easily could they conduct raids or probes from one side to the other, against each other? Uh, usually, and again, we have the, uh, the military manual on skill machine written about uh, the, middle of, the middle of the 10th century, 950s, 960s, probably, uh, but reflecting the experience of fighting between the Byzantines and the Arabs of the previous centuries. So, um, 
from the introduction to this manual, the Byzantine author, probably a hierarchy in general of the uh, of the Eastern themes, the Eastern um, uh, the Eastern battalions. Uh, he's saying that um, he's dividing these invasions, these the, the so-called razias, uh, the invasion from the Arabs. Uh, he divides them into three uh, main uh, categories, and the first is the uh, small-scale invasion of a few hundred men that could take place at any time, usually in the summer, but that's not necessary. And uh, they could come from across the border, on the opposite, from the opposite uh, main town uh, across the border, and led by the local frurachos, so the local commander. Uh, that usually didn't pose much of a danger for the uh, for the local authorities. It was much more of a nuisance, uh, skirmishing. Mm. Uh, the second category was more dangerous, and the second category referred to by the Byzantines were the uh, a few th- when a few thousands, uh, usually between three and five thousands of the enemy troops would gather in uh, major cities of the borders, like Tarsus, for example, mm-hmm. on the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, at the end of the summer, either the end of August or beginning of September, they would be led by the local emir. Uh, sometimes uh, we even have the, uh, the caliph, but usually the local emir or uh, a high-ranking uh, officer of the uh, uh, of the Arabs, uh, and they would invade. Uh, they would cut a very deep thrust into Byzantine territory, and these were very dangerous uh, razias. And the final category, of course, we have the major invasions of tens of thousands of troops led by the caliph, and of course, the strategic target would be uh, a main city of Anatolia, or even Constantinople itself until the until the eighth century. Mm-hmm. So the, it depends on the number of the troops, uh, the, whether they would be uh, they would be gathering uh, across the border or in these major cities of the borders. Again, one major city is of course uh, Tarsus mm-hmm. uh, in the northeast uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. I'm still trying to get my head around how the borders change, uh, become more formally changed. Um, is it, you know, d- w- would one side take take control of a few uh, small areas near a major city and then take the major city and it was done? Or was it basically, um, I- I'm trying to figure out how, how a state of permanency as far as a border change might have been achieved. If that yes. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, of course it does. Um, again, it's it's very fluid, and uh, what John Halden has introduced in the study of Byzantine military history is the uh, so-called defense in depth, and this is a very useful. Of course, it is a modern term, but it, I think that of course it can be applied to Byzantine military history because. This defensive depth shows how uh, fluid this, the, the status of these uh, towns and cities in the borders was. Um, uh, when the, the local populations of the, of the borders uh, were given a warning that there was uh, an enemy invasion, uh, whether it was of an invasion of a few hundreds or a few thousands, uh, if it was a few thousands, then they would usually retreat into the major uh, fortress town of the region. And uh, then the enemy had two choices, whether to uh, besiege the town or bypass it. Uh, whether, they, whether the enemy would bypass the city, that means that uh, the enemy had more important strategic targets than this city. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the main point is that you can take as much land 
as you can. If you do not take the city, then there is no point. Hmm. And these uh, towns, fortresses, or major cities in the borders from the Mediterranean up to Armenia, they would change hands so often that the locals would even forget, you know, to whom they were paying their taxes sometimes. <laughs> it was that often. But that's the point. You have to, if you want to control uh, a region, you have to take the city. If you do not take the city, then there is no point. Mm -hmm. There is no point because the troops cannot spend a winter patrolling a dead land because I, uh, I have, I visited Eastern Anatolia, uh, in 2015 and you can drive and drive for miles and miles and miles and you don't see anything living again in 2015. So imagine a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. There is not, it is a barren country, Eastern Anatolia and the Central Plateau, of course. So Central, but Eastern Anatolia is desolate. There is absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. You can drive hours and you can see nothing. So if you do not take the cities, you control nothing. Mm -hmm. And that was the point. Um, if you send an invasion of a few hundreds, that means that you most likely are, are in for some booty. Mm -hmm. If not, that means that you have to take the city. Mm -hmm. And if you take the city, that means that you impose your authority, you impose your own governor, you put a few dozens or a few hundred troops, and then you can say that you have control over the region. If not, then you just think, as I said, you just think for the booty and to take the holy war to the infidels. Mm -hmm. So I guess if uh, one side tries to take a city and is failing, they don't want to push it too far because then you you leave yourself open to a counterattack where the other side can push and take one of the exactly. cities. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So, um, these are, these are tactics that go back to antiquity. And this is another, uh, another very interesting thing that I spotted, uh, at the beginning of my career. And this is what, you know, what I've been interested in. The, this transmission of military knowledge through the ages, not just geographically. So what I'm doing in my book, I examine this transmission of military knowledge, uh, in, uh, in one period. But geographically, but what I've also been studying and what I'm also interested in uh, for many years is uh, transmission of military knowledge through the ages and basic principles of war, going back to Sun Tzu and Aeneas Tacticus, so uh, the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century BC, is that if an enemy invades your country, then invade his mm -hmm. to draw him away. So if the, if the Byzantine governor, the local governor, realizes that it is just uh, a skirmish, so just a local invasion of uh, a few hundred troops, then that's fine. They can take the whatever sheep they can find and whatever uh, men they can find so that they will sell uh, slaves and, you know, they can uh, get back to their country. But if there is a serious invasion, then... These military manuals of the 10th century, they give specific instructions to the uh, local commanders as to what they have to do. And this is what John Halton named defense in debt. So you let them invade and you let them uh, get laden with uh, booty and slaves and tired and stretch their logistics. Mm -hmm. And when they decide to return to their country, whether you invade their country at another point or you attack their column mm -hmm. when they're to their country. So this is the basic advice that the Byzantine generals, the Byzantine tacticians advise uh, the reader to do. Hmm. So were both sides, were they using the same uh, tactics, weapons, um, equipment, that sort of thing? Or how much of a difference was there between them? Uh, by the 10th century, we see great, great similarities in terms of equipment, uh, because we see, uh, units, let's say, of heavy cavalry to be introduced, uh, that, uh, that were not used before the 10th century. So that, let's say that, uh, they appear in the sources around the 930s and 940s. 
uh, and um, this unit uh, didn't exist before in the primary sources, or it didn't exist for a couple of hundred years, and then they reappear. This famous cataphracty, this heavily armed cavalry of the Byzantines, uh, they disappeared in the they disappeared in the sources in the seventh century, but then they reappear. Uh, at the time of the reconquest of the Byzantine expansion, and that means something. That means that the Byzantines can use them again against the Arabs. Now, uh, another unit that uh, is introduced for the first time in the Byzantine army is a unit of uh, heavily armed infantry armed with 12 meter long pikes, very similar to the Macedonian phalanx. Mm-hmm. And they have more or less the same tactics. They are called menavlati. And they appear at the same time in the 930s. Again, that means something. What this means is that they act as a buffer to the enemy cataphracty, the enemy heavy cavalry. Hmm. So the Byzantines are adapting to the enemy, uh, to the enemy tactics and they put a buffer before their main infantry to uh, to cushion the uh, the enemy attack of the heavy cavalry, mm. and then what the Byzantine tacticians advise is that once the uh, enemy heavy cavalry uh, begins to withdraw, then launch your cataphracty, your heavy cavalry. So you see that the equipment and the different units that are introduced in this period they show that both sides are adapting to the enemy. Fortunately, the Byzantines have military manuals for the period. The Arabs do not. The, uh, the Arab military manuals are later. They are um, usually, mostly they are in the Mamluk period. So they are about 150, 200 years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we are fortunate to have these Byzantine military manuals and they show this adaptation that I'm talking about in terms of units, tactics, but also equipment. This long pike that is introduced for the first time in this period, this shows adaptation, again, this uh, sort of a buffer. Mm-hmm. So can we uh, turn toward to, to the what you use, the resources you use for your research? You mentioned, of course, the manuals, the military manuals. Can you talk about yeah. other primary documents and archaeological evidence that uh, you applied to this? And I know there's a lot, so, or I imagine. Uh, um, well, there is... No, to be honest, there is surprisingly little, unfortunately. I mean, I would be I would be a very happy man and a very happy historian if I had more. But the two main categories of the sources that I've used are, of course, the, first of all, I've used the military manuals. And, uh, again, that's the theory. And then I use uh, histories and chronicles uh, for this period. Uh, unfortunately... Uh, when it comes to archaeology, uh, battlefield archaeology for this period is not uh, is not very advanced, and it is almost uh, it is very difficult, let's say, to even locate the battlefield. Hmm. Although the sources say that the uh, the battle took place close to a castle, to locate a battlefield so that perhaps they there could be an excavation. Uh, by battlefield archaeologists, uh, it is extremely difficult and it hasn't been done. There is no single study of the, uh, no single archaeological study, archaeological excavation of these battlefields in the 10th century, at least to my knowledge, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, uh, but when it comes to Written sources, as I said, the two main categories that I've used, the two main pools of evidence are the, uh, the military manuals and, of course, Greek, uh, Arabic, and Armenian sources. Again, because I wanted to see how contemporary and later historians and chronicles uh, describe these pitch battles. Uh, of the middle of the 10th century. So basically, these were my sources, and uh, I would love to have more, but unfortunately, archaeology uh, is not helpful. It hasn't been helpful. So as far as um, 
the actual equipment, um, do, do they find the equipment in, you know, graves and excavations in the major cities? Um, how, how do you know about the, the, the equipment? We know about the equipment because, again, we have uh, descriptions of uh, descriptions of weapons in the primary sources, mm-hmm. but we have, uh, from the Byzantine side, we have uh, mostly paintings, of course, ecclesiastical paintings in churches, mm-hmm. and archaeology helps to locate uh, weapons. Uh, whether it is uh, um, armor or, of course, it's very rare. It is extremely rare for this period. But we have uh, several kinds of uh, body armor and equipment uh, of this period from both sides and uh, different kinds of arms, uh, especially swords and spears. But you just have to surmise and say that the um, to categorize, let's say that in this period we have this and this and that uh, arms and armor for the Byzantines. So we can surmise that the uh, the Byzantine units that they were fighting against the Habsburgs for this period, they were fighting in these kinds of armor and they were carrying these kinds of weapons. So it is. Uh, extremely difficult, not to say impossible, of course, but it is extremely difficult to say that a unit of the Byzantine army that was stationed in the southeastern borders, uh, what kind of armor they had or what kind of an equipment. It is almost impossible to know with certainty, but we know that in general, in that period of the middle of the 10th century, the Byzantine army was equipped with these kinds of weapons. So most likely, there would have been local variations, like, for example, in um, the manuscript of Stilitsis, of John Stilitsis, which is the only illustrated manuscript, Byzantine manuscript that we have of, from this period. Uh, it shows, although it is l- a little bit later, it shows uh, eastern helmets, for example, that they have a neck cover, of course, to protect from the uh, scorching sun, Hmm. of East Anatolia. Uh-huh. So these kind of um, uh, variations in the equipment uh, we can see in these uh, drawings, in these uh, uh, paintings that we have in the churches, and uh, in the descriptions in the sources. But it is like uh, trying to find information like a needle in the haystack. It's like bits and pieces here and there, and then it's the it's a very arduous task of trying to reconstruct this equipment, but it is it is uh, terribly difficult sometimes. Mm-hmm. So in the many years that you've been doing this research, uh, what part would you say has been the most enjoyable? Traveling. <laughs> Traveling for my research, because um, I will give you one simple example. Uh, also related to your previous question about the equipment, um, I was working with another uh, uh, colleague of mine, uh, Professor, Professor Raffaele D'Amato, uh, also an expert in the Byzantine army of the period, but he's, he's an archaeologist, of course, I was a historian, and we, um, we had a project for a year that was funded by the Turkish government mm-hmm. in 2015. That's why I visited Anatolia. So our project was to uh, photograph uh, all the military saints in Byzantine churches in modern-day Turkey. Hmm. So, St. George, St. Demetrius, the Archangels, etc., etc., all these military saints, and try to show the development of the equipment of the Byzantine soldier, whether infantry or cavalry, through the ages. Mm-hmm. So let's say that uh, a 7th century Byzantine church depicting uh, St. George uh, would show St. George, who was, of course, a cavalry officer, in a specific equipment. And if you take a photo of St. George in a 12th century Eastern Anatolian church, then the equipment differs significantly. Mm-hmm. So again, that shows the development of the, uh, of the Byzantine army's equipment. And that was a one-year project between February 2015, February 2016, and it was because of that that we traveled in Eastern Anatolia, and that was the best trip 
one of the best trips of my life, mm. traveling. <laughs> yeah. It seems interesting that they would paint uh, saints in in contemporary uh, weaponry. In, in a um, it's, uh... Yeah, there are there are different theories, and I believe that uh, of course there are others who say that the uh, the artist who was painting um, the uh, the saint uh, would be very uh, old fashioned or very conservative in his design. So you always leave, let's say, you know, like fifty or even a hundred years of. Uh, uh, let's say that if the if the church was built in the 950s, then probably this the artist who was depicting Saint George would depict uh, the equipment as it would have been, let's say, at the beginning of the century. Mm-hmm. But uh, according to most, not all, but according to most of the uh, archaeologists of the period, they believe that this is what was happening. So the artist would see a Byzantine infantryman, an officer, or a cavalry officer, and he would paint St. George according to what he was used to. Mm-hmm. And especially when it comes to uh, smaller places, uh, like uh, islands of the Aegean, that are very very small communities. So um, the, probably the artist wouldn't have uh, traveled outside the island or his local communities, so this is what he would have seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and how he depicted the the saints. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, what uh, what did you find that was most surprising in your research? <laughs> I, I would I would um, first of all I would expect that I would have found you know more evidence. And this is uh, I started you know very well. Usually, uh, scientists and of course historians included uh, they they start their project you know. Uh, very optimistically, but hmm. then they are, uh, whether they have a crash landing or a not so smooth landing, again, that depends. But, um, you know, that was a project that I, uh, that I was dealing with, uh, for about eight years, on and off, uh, because mainly of, uh, you know, budget issues. And, um, uh, Halfway, halfway there, I realized that yes, I'm surprised that you know I cannot find more. I'm surprised that I cannot find any studies, uh, books, or articles uh, about any uh, from archaeologists that would have excavated any of the battlefields or any of the local fortresses. Um, and I was uh, surprised that you know the amount of information that we have for such a crucial period. Because let's not forget that this is a period where Byzantium is expanding, and this is a glorious age, Mm -hmm. that I was expecting to find more. And uh, this is what I say in the concluding section of my book, in the conclusions, that um, unfortunately, we can only surmise that, you know, we can deduct only a certain amount of conclusions from the uh, information that we are getting from the sources, so that it would be highly dangerous to try to stretch all the information that we have you no know, more to stretch it more and you know that would, we would enter into a very dangerous territory so that was surprising and uh, what else no that no that was it actually that was it that was the most surprising thing that I was expecting more and I didn't find it. I didn't find more <laughs> hmm. so apart from what you've already discussed was there a question or issue that was the most difficult to research and come to a conclusion or to, to, to get close to a conclusion on? I know there's a lot, but was there one question that really, you know, has your imagination? Uh, again, uh, what is, uh, despite the fact, again, that this is a very, uh, the very important period for both the Byzantines and the Arabs, I was expecting that uh, the description of the battles, of so many crucial uh, battles, would have been more detailed. And um, my access to the material was also uh, surprisingly limited because um, the Arabic sources, for someone who uh, has the handicap of not actually having studied Arabic, 
and uh, the fact that I had to rely on translations. What I was also surprised to find uh, it was that the only uh, the only translation of the Arabic uh, of the Arabic sources for the period for the wars with Byzantium in the 10th century were translated by very famous, of course, Byzantinists uh, almost a hundred years ago in what many modern scholars would now say a poor edition, meaning, of course, that, you know, there should be another much updated and uh, a better one. Mm. So if that answers your question is that, yes, I... I encountered many, um, many difficulties, and you know when you compare the interest that uh, modern historians have for the to translate and uh, publish the Byzantine sources, it is surprising why uh, so few have been interested in uh, translating. The Arabic sources of the period, so it's like it's great. It goes one way because, of course, Byzantium is more, um, it's much more interesting in terms of you know studying its sales, it sells more, and there are more people that are willing to learn Greek rather than Arabic uh, from experience, mm -hmm. speaking from experience. So um, I would say that you know if I had the energy and the uh, not just the energy <laughs> to take Arabic. This would this would be you know the the first thing that I would do just to translate these sources and you know just publish a much more updated edition of this extremely valuable uh, Arabic authors of the period. Are there if if you had your choice, are there any undiscovered battlefields or reference sources that haven't been discovered yet? What would you like to see? Uh, what would you like to see found and, and excavated or discovered in some vault, some ancient vault? Equipment, equipment, and the equipment that we see uh, being described in the military manuals and the sources. You know, I would like to see these long pikes of the of the Menavlati. I would like to see uh, a curved saber of the of the period, if there was any in this period. Mm -hmm. I would like to see. Uh, the kind of armor that we have been, that we have, we have descriptions of in the primary sources. So, equipment, because we lack, uh, archaeological evidence from this period, mm -hmm. uh, both sides of the border, not only the Arabs, but also the Byzantines, uh, be, um, we have archaeological evidence uh, for the late Byzantine period, so mainly, you know, the following the Fourth Crusade, but um, when it comes to uh, archaeological evidence uh, for the 11th century or the 10th century or even before, the uh, the artifacts that we have, the archaeological evidence that we have is extremely rare. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I would love if the if someone would be interested, you know, in excavating uh, fortresses, but the areas around the fortresses as well. Because, as I said before, the main battles would take place either close to a main fortress, fortress town, or major city, but mainly fortresses, or uh, in a very narrow defile, uh, because the uh, topography and the geography of southeastern Anatolia is uh, well, southeastern Anatolia is a very mountainous region, and mm -hmm. topography plays a highly important role on where battles will take place. Because usually they will wait them, they will ambush them, mm -hmm. and there will be a battle. Usually uh, in the files. So um, I would be, I would be very extremely, I would be extremely interested to see any findings mm -hmm. uh, for this period. Can you name maybe two or three battles uh, that you'd love to see their locations discovered and, and excavated? Um, mainly the battle, the, the battle outside Tarsus, well, that was very important. Mm 
uh, the major city uh, on the uh, southern approaches to uh, uh, to the Taurus Mountains, and the Battle of Al Haddad, mm-hmm. which is uh, a key fortress uh, in the so-called Cilician Gates. These the Cilician Gates is the main highway of the Middle Ages from uh, well, into Anatolia. So coming from northern Syria, you would turn west and then you'd cross the Taurus Mountains through the Cilician Gates in order to enter the uh, Anatolian Plateau. So these battles of the period uh, outside Tarsus, close to Tarsus, and uh, the Battle of Al-Haddad uh, in the middle of the century, they are crucial and I would love to... Uh, see some uh, archaeological evidence from uh, from this battle, from these two battles. So j- that's just a tip for any young archaeologists who might be listening and interested in, <laughs> in this period. <laughs> exactly. Please, please, and send me your reports, please. <laughs> <laughs> so was there anything you discovered that uh, emotionally moved you in some way, either happily or, or sadly or in any way? Um, uh, it's... <sighs> Because of my nationality, it's even more sensitive because I'm Greek. And I'm a Greek working in Istanbul slash Constantinople and doing research in uh, Asia Minor and Anatolia and having a chance to travel in uh, Eastern Anatolia, especially when uh, in 2015, that's why I'm saying that uh, that trip was... Um, scientifically, was one of the the most important uh, trip in my life because uh, when I stood in what we suppose, because also there haven't been many archaeological excavations for the Battle of Manzikert, the famous Battle of Manzikert in 1071, where uh, Romanus the Fourth was defeated by the Seljuk Turks of Apaslan. Um, when you travel in these areas that you've been studying for years and years and years, and you um, you drive through the what quite possibly the Byzantine troops would have not driven but ridden, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, when you reach um, a geographical location where most likely this famous battle will have taken place. Um, I wanted to cry. It's as simple as that. I cannot explain it, how I felt emotionally, but I, I wanted to cry. So I think that says it all. How you feel when you, what you've been studying for years and years and years, you actually go there and you see it and you see the location. You see where the castle was. You see the surrounding ma- uh, mountains, the mountain ranges. You see the topography the clouds, you see uh, maybe a local stream or, you know, whatever, and you can imagine riders attacking from right and left. It's, it's, it's not that difficult. Mm-hmm. Nice. Nice. That sounds pretty, pretty good. Pretty yes. fun. So what do you hope, what do you hope the book will do? Um, w- <sighs> what I would like it to do. Well, to stir up interest, you know, for this period, to, I would like to receive an email uh, a few years ago that, you know, this book, you know, stirred up interest for Byzantium to a young scholar. That's what, uh, that's all I want to do. I don't, I'm answering questions, but, you know, to answer questions is not the main thing. The main thing for me is to stir up interest for what I do. Mm-hmm. This is what I want. This is what I, and this is why I also, you know, uh, give this interview because, you know, I want more people to, um, sit down and study and, uh, get interest in, you know, military history of this period and of this region and of, uh, of Byzantium in general. Mm-hmm. This is what I want. Yeah. Before we spoke, I, I thought, you know, this, the Byzantium Empire and in this period, I, I thought there was a lot more available, um, but it seems like uh, there's such a dearth and it, and it needs more. Exactly. And um, unfortunately, uh, many historians have the tendency of dealing with the glorious periods. 
So many people will, there's, there's so rich bibliography about Justinian, Heraclius, Basil II, the so-called vocal slayer. But when it comes to the not so glorious periods, the period of, uh, the so-called dark ages or the periods where, uh, there are not so famous battles, the period where uh, there is not a clear-cut war between two nations, and there is what I called in the introduction of my book something that was a war, but not exactly a war. There were uh, raids and counter-raids, so this is not such a glorious uh, pitched battles as we were used to, you know, in these glorious campaigns of Justinian, for example. So I like to deal with the not so glorious periods of Byzantine history mm-hmm. and periods and topics that have not been dealt with in uh, in detail. So that's what I that's where I want to make my to leave my mark. Mm-hmm. And hope is that uh, in a few years um, other young scholars will read my mark, will check my mark, and they would like to leave their own mark and improve. Because that's the point. I'm not saying that, you know, what I'm doing now is the definitive study of the period. No, but I, what I want to do is for other scholars in the future to build on what I've written so far. And that will make me happy. Mm-hmm. Did you have any difficulties actually finishing the book or getting it published? And if so, how did you overcome those? There was. There was. And this is actually, you know, um, this is the experience that I want to pass on, you know, to some other scholars, to younger scholars, because um, finding the right publisher is key. Uh, not only in terms of the, uh, of the interest of the, of the editors, uh, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to name the, um, uh, the publishing houses, but... Uh, uh, Edinburgh University Press was not my first choice for many reasons that had to do with previous contracts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, the publisher the, to whom I sent the draft, the let's say, well, not the final draft, but you know what I what I had at the time to send to uh, to a publisher, um, went through a peer review, and the reviewers. Uh, they send me very detailed comments, uh, really helpful comments, but they believed that I had to take my book to a different direction. I had to talk more about the uh, impact of war in societies, and uh, which is which was fine. It was very interesting, but this is what I wanted to write. This is not what I. This is what. This is not what I. What I've dreamt and what I wanted and what I've planned to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so they suggested some major changes in the direction of the book, and I disagreed. Although it took me about six months to answer to answer back to the editor, mm-hmm. and I was very close to not publishing the book. And as I wrote to some of my friends to cannibalize it, and, and you know, uh, saying that you know I will not publish it as a book, but I will publish it in the form of you know four or five you know individual articles, and that's it. And many of my academic friends uh, they encouraged me to um, improve on the uh, on the book and to send it to other publishing houses. Mm-hmm. but might see it with a different eye. And this is what happened. And I was patient, and I sent it to Edinburgh University Press, and their series editor liked it as it was, and the reviewers liked it as it was, and after a two-year delay, it will finally get published. Mm-hmm. Nice, yeah. Patience yes. and perseverance. Exactly, 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 exactly. Yeah. Good, good. So what's your next writing project? Ah, I have many. <laughs> uh, again, um, now what I, what I have in mind, and actually uh, I, uh, last week, uh, uh, I, um, one of my projects was approved by uh, Rutledge to publish a collective volume on uh, war in 11th century Byzantium. And uh, the 
my contribution would be to study what I've been doing for my uh, book with Edinburgh University Press, but to expand it to cover Anatolia. So what I will study, uh, the uh, exchange of military tactics and how military cultures interacted and adapted to their enemies. So uh, basically, I will expand the, uh, I will apply the same questions and the same ideas to, to cover the entire region of Anatolia, the entire region of Asia Minor, and I will involve the Byzantines, the Seljuk Turks, the Crusaders, and uh, the Armenians, and all the people who were fighting in Anatolia in the 11th century. So in essence, the same questions, but in a more expanded uh, period and a more expanded geographical area, the area of Anatolia. Okay, so where can people find the book and where can they find you and, and maybe your other thoughts and writings on online, social media, that sort of thing? Uh, well, my, my, my book is out in, in October uh, by Edinburgh University Press, and uh, I do not have a personal website, but I have a profile in uh, academia.edu, mm -hmm. so uh, people can find all of my uh, publications, of course, that are not copyrighted, but they can find all of my publications and uh, my ideas for future projects uh, in, uh, in, in academia. So that's all the the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? I hope people enjoy the book, and I hope that sometime, as I said before, I will receive an email saying that uh, your book got me interested in Byzantium, and thank you very much. <laughs> all right, thank you. This podcast has been presented by War Scholar. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com for more great interviews and military history information. Your visits help support this podcast. One of the best ways to provide feedback for this podcast is to rate me on iTunes. Please give me a good rating if you liked it, or feel free to give me a bad rating if you didn't. I'll use that feedback to make this a better podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram under Chris Alvarez War Scholar. That's Chris without an H, C-R-I-S. On Facebook under War Scholar, on YouTube under War Scholar 1945, and on Twitter under War Scholar. Thank you, and I hope you return to this podcast for more great military history.